apologize. Put the gun down before you kill someone. Teenage girls die Hello, and welcome to another Dollar Store Drive-In. I'm your host, Laura. I'm Joel. And we're the Newly Dads. Thank you for joining us. If this is your first time watching, welcome. Uh, we are a half-hour chat show where we discuss a movie that we watched. Um, and, you know, Mr. Newly Dad likes to put together some cute trailers and stuff like that. Uh, we also uh, put this on as a podcast. So if you're listening to this, thank you for listening. Um, but this is a visual show, so if you want, you can find us <laughs> at thenewlydeads.com and find all of the channels that we're on. We're on a lot of different places now. Everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. Um, one of them being YouTube, so you can find us there. But all of the links will be at our website at thenewlydeads.com. Um, so, uh, again, if this is your first time watching, thank you. Uh, we do have some criteria for the show. Um, also, if this is not your first time watching, welcome back. Um, but uh, in order for us to make this a structured program and not us just <laughs> rambling on about some crazy movie, um, we, we do that in our spare time. We do do that in our spare time. Um, we have some criteria. So the first is that this needs to be a uh, horror genre kind of movie, uh, thriller or sci-fi type of, of, of movie. I forgot to say that it needs to be under five dollars. <laughs> um, usually, we find it at like the dollar store. This one's a dollar store find, I believe. Dollar Tree. A Dollar Tree. Sometimes we find it at like a thrift store, mm -hmm. different places like that. Um, and it needs to be a movie that we've never watched before. <clears throat> so, I'm still getting over my cold a little bit. So, if I sound a little like of a clamped. Uh, that's why, but um, I'm on the mend, so it's been over like a week and a half now, I think, since I've had my cold. So um, minute, yeah. hopefully, I don't sound super nasally, but uh, mm -hmm. I did last week for sure. A little bit. A little bit. <clears throat> yes. Um, but this week we watched a movie that is not a horror movie for sure, but it is definitely an odd movie. It's called Visioneers, starring Zach Galifianakis. Uh, I would definitely consider this to be like sci-fi-ish. It falls into that wheelhouse, and, and you'll understand why I chose it to begin with, because mm -hmm. I was really on the fence until I saw one word. Right, <laughs> yes. And that's um, what pushed it over. <clears throat> yeah. It's on the front, it says Office Space, Office Space meets Brazil in this offbeat comedy. I don't know what Brazil is. Do you know what that is? The Terry Gilliam classic. Oh, right, 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 right. Uh, it says, Zach Galifianakis is hilarious. I would say that this movie is not really hilarious. No, no he's, he's actually... Uh, it's a pretty serious... Came down and, and pretty serious. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so not it's funny. Comedy. It's funny that they say he's hilarious in this. Because it's a not, a, bit of, a, little it's not bit a really of, funny movie. <clears throat> you know, it's yeah. more of a thinker, maybe. It is a thinker. Um, actor, comedian Zach Galifianakis uh, from The Hangover Part 2 and Due Date. Stars it in this outrageous comedy from Jared Drake. Uh, so George, uh, who is played by Zach, uh, is stuck in a bleary job working as a mid-level manager in the surreal Jeffers Corporation. After employees begin spontaneously exploding as a result of their uneventful lives, George's doctor warns him that if he doesn't get out of his rut, he could be the next to go. As his co-workers continue to detonate, George is forced to reevaluate his mundane existence before he blows up. Literally. Judy Greer from Arrested Development and a myriad of other things. Um, and indie favorite James LaGrosse star in the movie Critics Called a Cross Between Office Space and Napoleon Dynamite. Which on the front it says Brazil, but on the back it says Napoleon Dynamite. They also credit him <clears throat> with Hangover 2 out of all of his... Film credits, they, only, they give him credit for that one, even though he's in all three of the films and a myriad odd, of things. Odd choices. Why would you choose The Hangover 2 of all of them? He's like, that's the one I'm most proud of. I mean, I'm not saying it's the worst <laughs> in the series, but it's just, it's an odd choice. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah. The Visioneers. It did win. It looks like it won a bunch of awards. Or at least it was nominated for some things. So it's like yeah. the Seattle International Film Festival. 
the Austin Film Festival. It was the winner at Cine, Cine Vegas International Film Festival. It was uh, an official selection at the Woodstock Film Festival and the AFI Film Festival. American Film Institute. Nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is a definitely kind of a different movie for us, I feel like. That's all right. We like to switch it up every once in a while. Keep you on the Yeah. Experience. Yeah. <clears throat> We've had some interesting, uh, interesting things that fell into our wheelhouse a little more thoroughly, and this one is way left the center. So yeah, but we we have thoughts. We'll get into that. We in do the, after we watch the the trailer. Yes. So um, Joel is going to play a trailer for us. This is I'm I'm kind of saying this for the podcast listeners, um, if there's any out there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm waving, but, but they can't see me. <laughs> It'll happen. Hi, podcasters. Somebody somewhere will, will be like, oh. Podcast listeners. Okay. Um, yeah. So he's going to pop up some sort of funky trailer. And I'm not entirely sure what um, what would go with this. Oh, can you just make it somebody pole vaulting? I don't know how that works, but we'll figure <laughs> something out, I guess. Just want like a little guy pole vaulting across the screen. Okay. You'll see why if you watch this movie. And there might be something in the trailer. I haven't actually watched the trailer yet, but I'm right. guessing because it's an integral part of James O'Gross's character, mm. perhaps it'll be in the trailer. Yes. We'll know when, we are, when we're watching it with you because we You'll like to watch it with too. you. You'll find out also. All right. So we're going to pause for a second while Joel revs up the trailer with a pole vaulter. And then uh, we'll come back and discuss. We'll be right back. Welcome to the Jeffers Corporation. Jeffers Morning, George. Jeffers Morning. Jeffers Morning. There are 1,200 minutes of productivity remaining before the weekend. Jeffers Morning, Level 3 Visioneer, George Washington Winster Hammerman speaking. I'm going to churn butter tomorrow. So it's fun. Howard, that's your father. I brought some chicken, Howard. It's delicious. Please don't explode. Nobody's gonna explode. Jeffers quote of the day. Give me productivity or give me death. What is the secret ingredient for an explosion-free life? Am I gonna explode? Normally, passive men like yourself are not the sort of men who suffer from dreams. Yeah! We have yet to isolate the connection between dreaming and exploding. How was your day? How was the thing? George and people were laughing at me. And when I looked down, my penis was missing. Does the doctor still think that you're going to explode? Oh! Oh! Happiness is being happy. It doesn't make sense. Do you want to be happy, George? I want you to grab that wife of yours. And I want you to just... Someone is not trying hard enough! Oh! Oh! Dreams are dangerous. What do you see when you dream? I'm George Washington. Wanna have fun and not blow to pieces Eat fried chicken, fried chicken, it's delicious We're back! I forgot to mention too that we do record this in our house So if you hear any like dog noises Our dog Bailey's kind of growling over there He hasn't really like revved up to like a full on bark But I just wanted to let you know because He's huffing around right you now You know, yeah We like recording in our home very comfortable because mm-hmm. we live here. Hopefully, you enjoyed that trailer. And now Joel's got some notes for you. So, whenever we watch a movie, I always take notes. That gives us a little bit of a guideline as we discuss the film in detail. Um, but I also tend to draw pictures, which uh, the lovely Mrs. Newly Dead will collect and put together at the end of the year along with her own that she does occasionally into a flip book that you will be able to check out at thenewlydead.com. <clears throat> And last year's is there and available now, as I stutter through my words. Uh, so go on and check that out. Um, so this week, i got to cover up what's going on next week and my suggestion. I drew... A fish. 
I don't know why I drew the fish, but mm -hmm. I did. Wrote a little bubble next to it that says, fish. Fish. oh, because we had fish for dinner. Maybe. Well, I mean, we didn't have real fish. We're vegan, but we had fake fish. Had fish. Uh, butter. Uh huh. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. <clears throat> yeah. And then uh, this little weird guy. And it says boom. A little cyclopsy weird guy. Boom. Like out of a Ray Harryhausen <laughs> epic. So, uh, Visioneers is from 2008. It's currently sitting oh. at. What? Eight, huh? 2008. Yeah. Wow. Sitting at 5.9 out of 10 on the Internet Movie Database. As uh, I believe, I think you mentioned this already, but it's directed by Jared Drake. Yes. Who uh, is also known for Greetings from Home. Uh, buried the 1982 Alpine Meadows Avalanche. And that's all that I have. I don't know if that's all he did or if I just didn't have room for the third one. I feel like there was a third movie that I didn't include. <clears throat> Visioneer. <laughs> Besides Visioneers. <laughs> uh, this was written by Brendan Drake, who wrote this. And then, I don't know, maybe exploded. I'm not sure. That's all it was. So Jared Drake cover. was the director. Yep, and, and Brandon, Brandon Drake. I wonder if that's his brother. I'm guessing he's related. <laughs> right. Um, and so, yeah, this, that's all he wrote. Um, who knows why. Uh, as she mentioned, this stars one Zach Galifianakis, who either you love him or you hate him. There's not a lot of in-between for people with him for some reason. I'm in-between. You're in-between. Oh, I guess there's one in-between here. Um, who is known for the Hangover films, all three of them. Uh, he's known for uh, Birdman, which is the Michael Keaton oddity. Mm. Uh, if you've never seen it, check it out. It's a good film, but it's <clears throat> not for everybody. It's a one-shot kind of thing, and it's interesting. Um, and Operation Endgame, which has been mentioned on this show before, which is an action movie that has Rob Codry and Zach Galifianakis mm. and a bunch of other people, a bunch of names that you know, um, that are all assassins trying to kill each other in like a assassin game. As you game. do. As you do if you're an assassin. <clears throat> uh, this also stars Judy Greer, who was in Halloween 1 and 2, the uh, recent uh, continuations of the story, kind of the alternate timeline, as it were. Uh, she was in Youth in Revolt, which I've not seen the film version, but I read the book, and uh, the book is fantastic if you've never read it. It's a, it's a chunky book. It's big, but it's good. Okay. It's chunky. And she was in uh, uh, several... Uh, Tim and Eric oh. shows. Yeah. And um, we both have discussed at length and, and we would uh, some Tim and Eric. I'm a fan. I've watched just about everything there is. Um, but uh, yeah, she was in that. And then the third person I wanted to mention was Faye Masterson, who was in The Lost Skeleton of Cadaver, as well as several of, well, almost all of the other Larry Blamar uh, films, which if you're not familiar with them, uh, Lost Skeleton of Cadaver specifically and the sequel, The Return of the Lost Skeleton is like a 50s uh, B monster movie kind of ripoff where he's a scientist and he finds a skeleton in a cave that um, I don't know what the deal is with it, but he's kind of a jerk. Is it yeah. an old movie? No. I mean, it's from like the, the early 2000s. Yeah. But it's it sounds spoofing. like. Yeah, it's like a 50s <laughs> right. black and white, super dry, but it's very funny. It's on the shelf. Uh, highly recommended. I, I've not it's, watched it. It's a comedy? Movies. Yeah. Mm. Um, I've not watched the other. He's done like three or four other movies that are similar. You showed me the little. Um, but I showed uh, you the box cover. Box cover, yeah. yeah. We'll have to watch the trailer because I think you played it. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, she was in Eyes Wide Shut, the uh, Stanley Kubrick film. And something called Sam's Lake, which uh, looks like a spooky movie. Hmm. Spooky movie. Sam's Lake. I just like saying spooky, spooky movie. movie. So at this point, my lovely wife turns to me and says. What'd you think? And this is where we really get into it. Yeah. So, uh, as she said, I wrote on my notes, boom, because the main, like, I'll say secondary premise. Eh, no, I think this is the main present thing in the movie. Is it's the, the thing that connects everything together. Yeah. The it's thread. Like, nobody wants to blow up. <clears throat> right. And everybody's trying not to blow up. Well, uh, <laughs> some people want to blow up. <laughs> and so, like, everybody's, you know, most people are trying whatever they can, and there's, you know, kind of religious people who are trying to say that they can make people not blow up. There's scientists who are saying that, you know, they can try and make you not blow up. The guy that's the head of the Jeffers company is, you know, saying he's going to help to keep people from blowing up. Everybody's got their own thing, but everybody keeps blowing up. Yeah, like one therapist told a guy that he needs to pull a, like a, a gun to his head and like pull the trigger every day. Once a day. <clears throat> and he blew up. 
Yeah. Spoiler alert. We won't tell you which guy it was. But if you yeah, because it's like it multiple people are like pulling the trigger every day. Yeah, that's true. Um, to like give them some sort of, I don't know, like adrenaline rush or something. I think that's or like, kind of the idea because they're trying, like you said, to not live a mundane life. Mm-hmm. But like Jeffers, the guy that owns the company that, that a lot of people work for, like that seems to be his whole stock and trade is trying yeah. to make things as mundane as possible. <laughs> yeah, every single week starts over with there's 3000 you know 999 minutes left of productivity for the week and like it just keeps counting down all the time it would drive me insane yeah i think that yeah (laughs) they don't really use their space very well because they have four people in this little office Office cluster fourth floor but they take like an entire like giant room uh on the fourth floor it's weird um but that's the whole point of this movie is that it is very like Corporate like dystopian sort of yes, but not really. It's modern. It's, yeah, it's it's unique. I mean, it's definitely yeah. It's it's definitely. A <sighs> you know what it almost it. reminds me of <clears throat> is that new show that's on Apple Severance. Severance would have been a good recommendation, but it's not my recommendation. Reminds me uh, a little bit of Severance. If you've never watched that, it's very interesting. And now, like Adam, is that his name? Adam Scott. Scott is the lead in that. Um, Patricia Arquette. Yeah. If you like that kind of movie or show, I should say, you you potentially might like this. It's yeah. <clears throat> it's a thinker, you know? Like, There's more going on than it seems. Right. It's just like, I feel like it's a commentary on how corporate life kind of sucks the life out of you. And just kind of life in general, too. Like yeah. People just kind of settle into settle a regiment. Yes. And they would rather than to, you know, be uh, happy. Shake up the, the yeah. shaker, they're going to just kind of just do the status quo kind of yeah. thing. And, you know, not it's about living it. your truth. Yeah. As, as they say towards the end of the movie, that uh, that uh, happiness. happiness makes you happy or, or, being happiness, happy happiness I forget. yeah, happiness is about being happy or something like that. It's like very, you know, it's like the duh. ultimate truth. Yeah, um, <clears throat> it's it starts out weird and you know, shocker. We we knew that it was kind of kind of be. There's a, a lot of like spoofs on things, and there's a one spoof where they have this like TV show or movie. I'm not sure. That's an action thing called oh. Mac Luster. Yeah. Um, and this guy is trying to keep people from blowing up in his show. And um, like almost like a MacGruber, fun. you know, kind of thing. Like if MacGruber and, and Napoleon Dynamite had a baby. Yeah. I don't know. It was it was probably my favorite part. I'd watch it. Um, and it, at some point in there, they also have a commercial or something for the crotch stop. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's, she's talking about she bought some yes adult things at the crotch stop yeah so part of the r- the ways of not blowing up is to have like a, a decent sex life and stuff and so they also talk a lot about butter that's why he drew butter lots <clears> of <throat> things involved using butter, butter. <laughs> that's gonna make you happy you know um, it's just lots of butter yeah it's a very quiet film um felt very independent which i'm pretty sure it was um for some reason they chose to to take the word chaos and pronounce it chaos. chaos. Everyone in the film says chaos. Everyone. No one says chaos. At any point during the film. Um, they the, make up weird words too. Like oh, each, each division. And... It's kind of funny. Cause like, um, well, the, it's, I'm going to say it starts off by Zach coming to work. Yes. It's like a Thursday or something like that. Starts or like a weekend, Wednesday. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's like one, 1,999 minutes till, you know, productivity for the week kind of thing, you know? So it's like halfway through the week maybe. And when he walks in, he's like, have a Jeffers day. And he flips off like the, you know, leader of the company kind of thing. And I'm like, I had noticed last week, I even think I said this when I was looking at it, I said, huh, like the symbol on here looks like a giant middle finger for like the company, you know, and it's the tower that they're in. And uh, come to find out that is a, a thing that they do because it's the, you know, the company logo or whatever. Everybody does it on Everybody does TV, it and it's on, not, it's not a, a threat, you know. But it's funny because sometimes people will say it and it's almost in, a, in like a passive aggressive way. But in the world, it's not 
an offensive thing, but it feels like it's meant to be offensive sometimes. Yeah. So. And everybody yeah, works on different levels in the company. And so, you know, uh, if you're on level five, you're a goob. And like, if you're on level four, where they're at, it, you're a tunt. Tunt, right. Not taunt, a tunt. A tunt. And they have to t- take tests to figure out where they fit into the company. Yeah. Uh, and tunts, I feel like they said that they're people, like people, people, you know, kind of thing, like yeah. people person. Um, but are quiet and like, there's like, you know, weird quizzes that they have to take. Like one of them was draw a picture of your vision of the future, you know, and, uh, that's very subjective. Drew, like a very interesting, like, <laughs> it was the ocean. It almost looked like an ocean. Yeah. But with like a bridge or something. No, it was or the it sun. Was the sun. Oh, right. It was yeah. Like, but it was in pencil. So it was, you know, kind of it was black and gray kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> but ultimately the movie kind of is a love story in a way. It is. It's uh, like, I feel like it's more like a, uh, like a love story, but also like, like I said, I feel like the moral of the story is to live your truth in order for you to find happiness and like, you know, to stop li- living like a, you know, like a fake life. Which everybody in the, everybody in the film seems to be doing that. And living a fake life. Yeah. If you've ever seen the wedding singer, Glenn Gulia is in this film. <laughs> Not not Glenn Gulley with the actor. Who the guy, Gulley. yeah. Um, and <clears throat> I, throughout the movie, I just I I didn't end up taking a lot of notes because I was paying attention and yeah. I like kept going like, okay, I don't understand what to what's going on exactly. I don't know what to write because things kept getting stranger. And then at the you know towards the end, I was like, oh, it's all about love and pole vaulting, um, because <laughs> his brother comes home and he had an epiphany and like ran off to a different country for a while or whatever. Right. So he sets up like a, a pole vaulting like area in the backyard because you're not allowed to dream. So when you start to dream, oh, right. right, you're not allowed to dream. So like if you're, if you're dreaming, then that means that you're unhappy, I think, and that you're going to blow up. Like that's their whole like thought process behind it. And he had this uh, like epiphany, like kind of like dream where he was pole vaulting as high as he possibly could, you know. And so that's his now his dream. And he's trying to like make that a reality. So he's like pole vaulting in the backyard of Mm -hmm. Zach's house. I guess he used to pole vault, it sounded like, if I remember right. When he was in high school or something. But so at first he's not very good. But as time goes on, he gets more and more proficient. And he starts drawing a crowd. It's like the Soul Asylum song says, you know, nothing draws a crowd like a crowd. And all of a sudden, it's like this big hippie, like, like Wood Woodstock kind of like. But it's almost party. cultish in a way. The way they're yeah. sitting there listening to him talk. And There's like him. a Ferris wheel or something there, right? There's a lot going on. Yeah, yeah they're having like like you know a party almost. In <laughs> and then backyard. eventually, like the FBI is like in the woods or whatever, and he's just like sitting outside the fence watching all this stuff going on, and he's like, "This is basically taking on something that's not even like what he had envisioned or whatever." So he's kind of mad about it, and then you know, says, oh, and the FBI is watching us. And like, he's like, they're in the woods and like, they're not in the woods. They're just on the outside of the fence, just like peering in or whatever. And it's, it's not even like a really surreal and kind of strange. It's like a really like, they're, they're not even hiding. Like they're just kind of, and they yeah. say FBI on the shirt. Nothing ever happens. It's funny. Yeah, they're just yeah. like, they're kind of as a <clears throat> right. weird little twist. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd say office space <clears throat> is definitely a good um comparison because they do say like you know office space or whatever like someone's boring bored at their job you know and if you've seen office space like he gets um hypnotized or whatever and then like loses that part of him that gives a crap (laughs) you know so i kind of get that like where they were going with the comparison of of office space and there's a bit in office space that is is like Something that that I it stuck with me, where he's like, you know, I, I did absolutely nothing today, and it was everything I wanted it to be. Yeah, and that's like that's like my that's his that's dream, my, my sweet spot. <gasps> Stop dreaming, you're gonna explode. I'm gonna explode. Uh, instantly, the, I thought maybe the explosions were gonna be, you know, gory more than they were. I yeah, mean, there is a little bit of a <clears throat> backsplash sort of thing going on, but not they don't. A lot. It's not blood though. No, it's they, like uh, it, it's like they blow up like they're like a glass almost or like rock or something like it's just it just they blow up and like it's like chunks of them but like no visceral stuff and i know when one of his coworkers workers like, there are some things left on his body when he goes home um but it's kind of like spontaneous would you've ever seen that movie i, I don't know, we didn't really like it that much but uh it's kind of like that where i was like oh people blowing up okay cool let's check it out and people 
kind of spontaneously combusted or blew up. But again, it was very like downplayed. It wasn't that wasn't the focal point. It wasn't like scanners, you know. Um, but anyway, so he makes a decision to kind of change things and. It ends up working out for him, but I won't, you know, I don't want to give away exactly what no. it does. Yeah, I mean, it's but. it's an old enough movie that I feel like, you know, some people might have seen it. Um, but it's also an obscure kind of movie because I've never heard of it before until you picked it up at the Dollar Tree. I've seen so. it, and it's been on my list to watch it at some point, but it's been on my list since 2008. So, yeah, Yay for coming around finally. Right. Um, I guess. I mean, that's really all we got to say. You want to rate it? Probably. So on a scale of butter, oh, fuck. I was going to say tunts, but you, you know, you can't really find I was gonna tunts. going to say, what am I going to put for tunts? I feel like it's like Lunt. Isn't that like a character from the... Mr. Lunt is from Veggie <laughs> Tales, but a Lunt is a, is a vegetable. I know. Or, or I know like fruit, Tunt uh, reminds me of Lunt, of you Lunt. know, or Mr. Lunt is the best a bad one. word that starts with a C. Yep. <laughs> I think that's where they were headed, you know, like goobs, oh, tunts, yeah, you know what I, I mean? Like, I, was, yeah. I couldn't figure out what I, tunt I got, but goobs, I was like, no, I For like taint. <laughs> it's, it's, it was, it was definitely a, an interesting ride that I will not soon remember. Not soon remember? You forgot about it already? Maybe. <laughs> uh, all right. So on a scale of whatever to butter. <laughs> Out of zero out to of five, five butters. butters. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I have a letterbox account in which I review all the movies I've been watching this year. First time I've actually <clears> done <throat> that. And uh, so if you want to check that out, you can find out before the show, but don't do it. Don't live life dangerous. Anyway, uh, so I ended up giving it a two. Yeah. I did not fall asleep, she but I also started to kind of lose my interest in it towards the end. Just because I felt like it was just kind of going on a little bit long and like, I don't know. So um, I would say about like two, two and a half. Let, let's go two and a half. Uh, I thought we were going to be on the same page. Yeah. I just feel like it's a decent enough movie. Like we've, you know, we've only given one thing like a four or a, like a five, you I know. I feel like Puppet Master, Lilith Wright got a pretty good review. I think I gave them a remember. five maybe. I don't know if I got that high. I don't know if we've had any that have been. I know that high, that's but. the thing, and I feel like out of the scheme of all of the things we've watched, you know, it was it was decent. And you know, I retract. I'm gonna give it a two. Oh no! Yeah, now you're back. Right? Yeah, just because I lost interest at the end, and I mean, I was drawing a little bit. I did draw, but I drew um like a at not not a not an accurate Zach Galifianakis, but a like a character kind of like looking like that. But it's not for. Public not feeling. for human consumption. Not for human consumption. It was, in her, it was in her little like journal book. It wasn't in like yeah. In I have like a daily journal book kind of thing that I draw in. Yeah. So if they don't want to watch this, what should they watch? Severance on Apple Plus. Yeah. Um, I, I would you recommend should. that it is. A it's very a much, weird show. It is very much a spiritual successor to this. Uh, season two is about to happen internally. <clears> if you're interested, which makes me happy because I was very afraid they were just going to end it after season one, and then yeah, I was like, a lot what? of unanswered questions. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so instead I thought about this and I was like, okay, I want to have a weird kind of office based movie that, um, doesn't, I mean, you're not going to find the exact same plot. I mean, good luck with that. Uh, but instead I went with, uh, 2001's Bartleby, which is the, uh, Crispin Glover retelling of the, um, short story by, I forgot the author. I, I, I knew who it was. It was in my brain and then I forgot. Bartleby. Anyway, it's by a fa very famous author. I'll I'll put it up here somewhere because. Sorry about this. I'm not going to play this the game. podcast, people. You have to look <laughs> it up yourself. <clears throat> You'll look it up. It's easy enough. But uh, it's all about a guy played by Crispin Glover who works in an office, a uh, very similar type office, um, and his boss is asking him to do things, and at some point he just decides that he would prefer not to. So he keeps saying, "I would prefer not to," and it just keeps on going. Everybody that asks him to do something, I prefer not to. And hmm. it's just this weird kind of, I, I remember enjoying it when I watched it back probably close to 2001, but um, if you like Crispin Glover, and I do, it's uh, one of his kind of weird little outliers that not everybody's seen. So. All right. Good enough. It is definitely not a horror though, sci-fi <laughs> or a thriller. I'm going to blow it up. 
<laughs> I like how you make the sound even though I'm making the sound. I know, sound. I did that on purpose for you. All right, what are we watching next week? Next week we are watching the one that's on the, the top here. Oh, on the back. is it Not a the multi? One inside. Yeah, it's a multi-pack. I didn't realize it <laughs> oh. when I first grabbed it. And then as I was in line paying for it, I realized. But we're watching Salvage. 2006's. Salvage? Yes. It says uh, it's a Crook Brothers film. Her oh. death keeps crawling back to haunt her. Do you know who the Crook Brothers is? No, I don't Oh, yeah, you're being funny. Like, I have no idea. Plus, there's two bonus movies in this. Is this one of the new ones we just got? Yep. Okay. Uh, we just went to uh, get a haul at the Dollar Tree, and we found that they had a ton. Uh, so we ended up coming home with like 12 movies or something like that. Um, but this one has three on it. And the second movie on the back is one that I've heard about and has been on my list to maybe see at some point. Okay. So this says it's a brutal armrest grabbing flick from uh, MTV said that. MTV. And the best American horror film you'll see this year says DVD Town. Oh, DVD Town. All Woo. right. I'm going to read That's it. That's the big leader, baby. <laughs> Do you know who Lauren Curie Lewis or Chris Berry is? I mean, I do because I was writing notes on this yesterday, okay. but no, I don't. Prior to uh, it's not rated. It's uh, got violence and profanity in it. All right. Claire Parker is going to die. Oh, no. At the hands of a sadistic and depraved killer, she oh, will no. endure a terrifying, unimaginably brutal death, and it will all happen again. After being beaten, dragged, sliced, and stabbed, Claire awakens at work where it all began, untouched and unharmed, but the hellish ordeal is far from over. The madman is back and ready for more blood. So it's kind of like Happy Death Day. Yeah, slash, like uh, you fell, you know, you, you fall asleep slash. and it starts all over again, kind of thing. Oh, interesting. I That's what it know. sounds like to me. Her death keeps crawling back to haunt her. Sounds like it could be interesting. Yeah, we like those kind of movies where it's like uh, trying to figure out like what's the key to keep them coming back over and over and over again, and how can they get out of it. And yeah, I like revisionist stories. So the fact that they keep telling the same story with slight little variations is right in my like this wheelhouse. Is, That's like my jam. This says it's like 2000. Well, on the DVD part, it says 2013. That's when the DVD was released, probably. Yeah. So yeah, the movie was 2006. Oh, six. So this is before oh, all true. that. Before like Happy Death Day and all that. Making yes. a weird face. Which well, instantly, if you've not seen Happy Death Day, you should watch that. You should watch Freaky. You should watch... Um, the Russian Doll. Uh, well, Russian Doll is a good show, um, but then there's also a third movie in that that uh, the Christmas one. Oh, it's a Wonderful Knife. Oh, that was good. Yeah. I like that. It's one. like uh, Scream at Christmas. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Well, we appreciate you coming to see us, and uh, hopefully, you'll come back next week. And until then, keep it cheap and creepy. Bye.
is 2.45 a.m., two hours and 15 minutes before time zero. At time zero, a new type of atomic explosion, a plutonium bomb, will be detonated at Desert Rock, Nevada. These soldiers are to experience the plutonium explosion under simulated combat conditions. it look, Colonel? I'm not sure. How could a thing like this happen? They've set off lots of these bombs before. Not a plutonium bomb they haven't. This is the first one. Sir, can't we leave? Can't we get out of here? No, Sergeant. You've got to wait until the chain reaction dampens or reaches a point of explosion. It could go off in a second, a minute, ten minutes, maybe not at all. Just have to wait it out. Can we smoke, sir? Sure. But keep hugging that trench wall closest to the bomb position. Won't be any warning when it goes. Colonel. Huh? Listen. That sounds like a plane. Light civilian plane coming in at 190 degrees appears to be in trouble. Ground to pilot. Ground to pilot. This is control. Can you read me? Still coming in. Ground to pilot. You are flying over an atomic detonation area. You are flying over a restricted area. Change your heading 180 degrees. Losing altitude fast. He's going down. Was he killed? I can't 
tell. He could be unconscious inside the plane. Colonel, that bomb could go off any second. Control, that pilot could be alive. What about the bomb? It's still activated, Colonel. Once the chain reaction has been triggered, there's nothing we can do to stop it. But there's a man in that plane. We're helpless, Colonel. Colonel, no! Another unit of blood, please. A unit of blood, please. <laughs> Nurse. How is he? Where have they got Colonel Manning that was in an accident? They got him over in surgery there, sir. Brought him out yet? They don't hold much hope for him. It was quite a mess when they got to him. Couldn't even find the plane or the pilot he was trying to save. You know, I was there covering the test for National News Service. Never seen anything like it. I've seen plenty. Please. You a friend of his? His fiance. Gosh, I'm sorry. What a fool. Please, can I do something for you, get you something? How long have you known Colonel Manning? Maybe if you talked about him, it'd help. You said you were there when it happened. Was he conscious when they reached him? I mean, was there much pain? He's been in a coma since he got to the hospital. I don't think he knew anything when that blast hit him. It was terrible. You know, they had the whole thing on film. There were 18 cameras embedded in concrete to shoot every phase of the explosion. Third degree burns on almost 100% of the body's surface and the man still lives. Unbelievable. By all the rules, he should be dead. We were to be married tonight in Las Vegas. We met in the funniest way. Our cars locked bumpers at a busy intersection in Chicago. He was stationed nearby at Fort Sheridan. He got so mad. He still ribs me about my driving. Glenn is such a wonderful man. He doesn't deserve a break like this. Why did this have to happen to him? Things like this just happen. It doesn't have to be a reason. He must have protected his eyes with his arm. He apparently covered them when the blast hit. 
That's one bit of luck. Luck? This man's luck ran out long ago. He'll die of shock before morning, and if that doesn't do it, infection will. I'll be sure he gets penicillin and cortisone around the clock. Although I think it's useless. There's always a chance. What kind of chance do you give to a man who hasn't a square inch of skin left on his body? He's already lost enough body fluid to be fatal. Well, we've done all we can do. Now we'll just have to wait. temperature at 80 degrees. I'm on a constant check on his pulse, hour by hour. Right. Uh, will he be all right, doctor? Are you Carol? Your name was the only word he spoke. Is he? He's still alive. He will be all right. I don't know. I wish I could give you some hope. and plasma continuously. Scissors, please. new skin. How's it possible? Yesterday this was dead tissue. And today, there isn't even a scar. What do you make of it, Paul? When skin is burned to the degree that it was on this man's body, it just doesn't grow back. So what's the answer? I don't know. It's not burned. Why, well, he's going to be all right, isn't he? And since you played a major role in the development of the plutonium bomb, Mr. Kingman, we hope that you may be able to help us to understand or to learn how Colonel Glenn Manning survived the blast.
I brought you the film taken during the explosion, but I don't see what can be learned from it, as far as your patient is concerned. The accident was unfortunate, very unfortunate. What more can be said? There are two answers that we're looking for. Now, the first is how Glenn Manning was able to survive the explosion. Chance. It just happened that conditions were such that he was afforded a certain amount of protection. What explanation would you give for the new skin that has grown on this man in a matter of hours? What possible connection could there be to the bomb? A man survives an explosion, a plutonium explosion, and then for some reason or other his skin heals more rapidly than usual. What is the mystery, gentlemen? Mr. Kingman, when 60 or 70 percent of a person's body is burned, he doesn't have much chance for survival. Now, if he should live, the skin that was destroyed does not grow back. It remains dead scar tissue. When a man suffers over a 95% body burn and less than a day later looks normal, I'd say that was a mystery. And you feel that the plutonium may have some unknown quality that is responsible? It's worth every effort to know. Now, I'll admit that you may be right. The plutonium possibly had nothing to do with it. There may be nothing more to this than a freak of nature. But if there is something to it, think of what it'll mean to medical science to have such a regenerative or healing power under its control. Shall we view the film? Like many of the atom tests, we built a model town to see how it reacted to the explosion. The protected cameras, such as this one, recorded the experiment. Watch this building when the heat of the explosion reaches it. There. Now the force of the blast. Here's another building. First burned, and then disintegrated. There's Manning. This was seconds before the explosion. The fact that Glenn Manning lived after the blast and that new skin completely replaced the burned dead tissue in a matter of hours leaves only one conclusion. Something out there is beyond the limits of our knowledge. Yes? I'm Lieutenant Klein, attached to security at the Nevada testing grounds. May I talk with you for a moment? Has Colonel Manning... Has something happened? No, at least not that I know of. However, as security officer attached to Colonel Manning, I've been sent to tell you that you won't be able to visit the Colonel at the hospital for a while. But why? Security reasons, ma'am. I wish I could tell you more, but, well, I really don't know anymore. I don't understand. What possible reason could there be to keep me from seeing him? Well, I was with the Colonel at the time of the accident, ma'am. I wish I could help you. I'm only carrying out orders. But he is getting well. Oh, I'm sorry. You'll have to wait until security is lifted. All right. Thank you, Lieutenant. Good night, ma'am. Good night. Excuse me, uh, could you tell me where they've taken Colonel Manning? I'm sorry, miss. I never heard of Colonel Manning. But you must have heard something about him. I'm sorry, miss. Uh, excuse me, 
My name is Carol Forrest. I'm Colonel Glenn Manning's fiance. Yes. I was looking for Colonel Manning. There's no visiting until 2 p.m. in the afternoon, Miss Forrest. I know that. And I also know that Colonel Manning is no longer in his room on the second floor. Where have they taken him? There's no Colonel Manning listed here. There's another hospital near Barstow. Perhaps you've made a mistake. I haven't made a mistake. I know Colonel Manning was here, and I insist on being told what you've done with him. I'd like to speak to the head of the hospital, please. He'll be back the day after tomorrow, so if you'd care to return. Where can I find Dr. Lindstrom? Don't tell me you've never heard of him. Oh, you mean Dr. Lindstrom from Rochester. That's right. Well, he was only here for a few days, called in on a special case. Did he return to Rochester? We wouldn't have that information. Sorry. Yes, sir. Come in, please. Yes, sir. Excuse me. You can't go any farther, miss. This is government property. Is this the road to the hospital? Yes, ma'am. I've come to see Colonel Glenn Manning. I believe he's a patient here. Well, there are no patients here, ma'am. Not since the war ended. Please, I've come a long way to see him. Oh. Just a minute. I'll phone the sergeant. Sergeant will see you. Now you stay on this road about a quarter of a mile and you can't miss it. You'll find the sergeant just inside the main entrance. Oh, thank you. an army officer who I believe was transferred here. Oh, what's his name, ma'am? Uh, Colonel Glenn Manning. Colonel Manning. Uh-uh. No Colonel Manning here, ma'am. Oh, I see. Uh, thank you, Sergeant. I was told that he might be here. Obviously, the party was mistaken. Sorry, I couldn't help you, miss. Uh, the guard will let you out the gate. Thank you. I hated to disturb you, Paul, by what you ought to see him. Has he had his intravenous feeding? Yes. Well, how's his respiration? Rapid. I can't understand this. Give me a stethoscope, Eric. He's breathing much more rapidly now. Changes every hour. Never received. It's understandable. 
Was she snap out of it? She's been unconscious since the accident. I'll keep the room temperature at 80 degrees. I want a constant check on these pulse hour by hour. Right. why we didn't let you in on Colonel Manning's condition, Miss Forrest. Primary being that Washington gave the strictest orders that he be isolated. Now, for obvious reasons, they ordered a security restriction over the whole affair. I want to help. Is there something I can do? We're doing everything that can be done, Miss Forrest. But what happened? What made him grow? Glenn Manning is growing from 8 to 10 feet a day. At the moment, he's 18 feet tall. Tomorrow, he'll be 26 feet. The next day, 35, maybe 40, and the next day... But you've got to stop it. Miss Forrest, we're trying. Believe me, we're trying. Let me explain it to you. Now, as you probably already know, the body is like a factory. It's continually producing new cells to replace the older cells, damaged cells or destroyed cells. Now, this happens in all the different parts of the body. Bone cells grow new bone cells. Skin cells grow new skin cells, and so on throughout the body. Now here, let me show you. This is an example of bone growth. Now the broken bone shown in this x-ray became the healed bone shown in this x-ray by means of bone cell growth. Now notice that the new cells join the broken bone together so that you no longer see any break. Now a cut, say in your hand, heals in the same way with new cells replacing the damaged ones. It is this delicately balanced process of new cells replacing dying cells or damaged cells that is causing the growth problem with Glenn. But how can this make his whole body grow? The process is out of balance. For some unknown reason, new cells are growing at an accelerated or speeded up rate, while at the same time, the old cells are refusing to die. This is what makes Glenn grow. That's what made the new skin. Then if you can stop this from happening... We can stop his growth. And if you can't... Then Glenn Manning will continue to grow until he dies. for you to volunteer. You should have waited until you were called. Honey, I'm in the reserves. They'd have called me eventually anyway. But it just isn't fair. You were just getting started. You've got your future to think about. I am thinking about it. Thinking about yours, too. Darling, we're going to get married just as soon as the thing's over. It can't last long. <laughs> Honey, will you please stop worrying? When you're safe at home, then I'll stop worrying.
through. You all right, Carter? Yeah, sure. That last one was close. How are the breaths? No. Not so good. Look out of the gun! How soon will the tent arrive? It's being flown in from Circus Winter Quarters in Florida. Should be here any time now. Well, he's already outgrown his room, you know. Well, as soon as you get the tent up, we'll break out the wall and move him. Right. Dr. Lindstrom? The reason I sent for you was that Manning regained consciousness during the night. Now, at the moment, he's suffering from the shock of learning about his condition. He won't talk to anyone. Oh, please, may I see him? I know he'll talk to me. See him, by all means. You know, psychologically, you may do him a lot of good. I want you to move quietly and unemotionally. You know, at his size, he's capable of pulling these walls apart. His height was over 22 feet this morning. I understand. Talk to me. They'll be able to help you. I know they will. The doctors are working night and day to find a cure for you, and they're very hopeful. Why, they're flying in Dr. Mayer from Sweden. He's one of the greatest specialists of cellular research in medicine. What else can I say to help you, Glenn? What sin? Could a man commit in a single lifetime to bring this upon himself?
Hey, bud. What's with this meat order they called in? I thought the army hauled in its own stuff. Come on, move on. All food deliveries are made to the stock room behind the kitchen. You'll find it at the far side of the main building. Twenty-five sides of beef. Who's going to eat it all? They haven't had any patients out here since the war ended. You fellas must eat pretty well. We'll invite you to dinner so you can help us. Now move this truck out of here. And what's the tent for? Something's going on out here that's mighty funny. We're going to have a circus every Saturday. Oh, now, come on, General. Let me in on the big secret. I won't breathe it too so. All right. If I tell you, will you move this truck? Right. It's for him. For who? The giant. What giant? The 30-foot one we got living here. Sure you have. Now to swing away from the seamy side of the news, many people are asking what happened to Colonel Glenn Manning, the army officer who was exposed to the rays of the plutonium bomb at Desert Rock, Nevada a few days ago. Eyewitnesses of the incident state that to all accounts he should have died in the blast. Is he alive or dead? What's all the mystery for Washington? Here in Las Vegas, Nothing yet. Let's give him double the amount. Let's try it. Would you mind if I tried something on my own? Mm, what is it? I'd like to attempt a practical application of the cellular theory we discussed yesterday. Fine. By the way, where's Manning? It's out with Carol. You know, he shouldn't be permitted to walk around. He should be confined. Confined? What he weighed this morning? 2,987 pounds. Let's see, five hours, which should make him over 30 feet tall. You know, it's funny, Carol. I was sitting here like this on the hillside, away from people and things. It's very funny. It reminds me of that picnic that we took once. See, that was... You know, time has lost all perspective. It's been a lifetime since that explosion. Everything that happened before seems another world, another life. That was a wonderful time. Before. What'd you say, Carol? Before I became a monster? You see, I don't mind a bit. You shouldn't. I shouldn't what? Talk about it, think about it? Do you realize that every breath I take Every movement, everything reminds me of what happened. Even when I try to sleep at night, close my eyes, so I won't see people in the world getting smaller every minute. The beating of my heart keeps getting louder and louder, reminding me. I should never have lived through that blast. You're alive, Glenn, and as long as you are, there's always hope. You know what they wrote about me in the college yearbook? The man most likely to reach the top. 
<laughs> Everything's going to be all right. I know it is. The doctors are working night and day to find a cure. They feel that if they can stop your growth, they may be able to bring you back to normal. You don't really believe that. They'll never find a cure for me. Are you all right? Shall I go for Dr. Lindstrom? I'm all right. I'm all right. I just don't want to grow anymore. I don't want to grow anymore! It's not going so well, is it? Doesn't he have any relatives? There's no one. He's all alone except for me. Carol, do you mind if I spoke bluntly? It's no good for you to be here. But who has more right? Well, in this case, I feel the right can be wrong. At first, I thought it might do him good to have you near. And of course, the government insisted that you stay. However, I'm going to recommend the security be lifted in your case. How can you ask me to turn my back on the only person who's ever meant anything to me? Why, I've got to be here to try to help him get well. Suppose that he doesn't get well. Drive back to the laboratory. There's something I want to show you. Paper, Sergeant. It's about you, sir. Let's have it. Man lives through plutonium blast. <laughs> That's a great joke, isn't it, Sergeant? <laughs> they call this living. <laughs> Ask me what it feels like to be a freak. Please, sir, I... I'll tell you. This is how it feels to be so big you can stick your fist through a circus tent. Like a clown. <laughs> Who else but a clown would have an expandable sarong like this, you know? It's adjustable. I can grow to be a hundred feet tall. And I don't need a change of wardrobe. Army ingenuity. Sir, may I leave? Why? 
You want to go back to your quarters and tell your friends about the monster? About the circus freak? Well, that's right, Sergeant. I'm a circus freak. Have a tent. We'll travel. Why don't you make me up a sign saying, See the amazing, colossal man. <laughs> that was it, wasn't it, Sergeant? You do think I'm a freak, don't you? But you want to know something? With me, it's different. I think you're the freak. I think you're the one that's different. I'm not growing. You're shrinking. <laughs> <laughs> that if you understand the circumstances more thoroughly, you will realize why it will be better for you to leave. Now this is a step-by-step -step illustration of Glenn's circulatory system in relationship to his growth. Now this illustration represents Glenn shortly after the accident. And this one is of Glenn as of a few hours ago. Now if you will look closely at each one, you will notice that all the parts are enlarging at the same ratio except for the heart. Now here. When it was of normal size, the heart measured approximately the size of the distance from his nose to his chin. However, at the size he is now, the heart measures the same as the distance from his lips to his chin. In other words, the heart has increased one half as much as the other parts of the body. Now remember when I explained the other day why Glenn was growing. I said that all the parts of the body consisted of millions of tiny cells that were rapidly and uncontrollably multiplying. Yes. Well, today we've learned that this theory does not apply to Glenn's heart. It is growing, but at a much slower rate. Now, the reason for this is rather technical, Carol, but to give you a simplified layman's explanation, it might be explained that since the heart is made up of a single cell for all practical purposes, instead of millions of cells like the rest of the organs of the body, it's reacting in an entirely different manner to this unknown stimulus or force that's behind this whole thing. No wonder he's always complaining about those sharp pains in his chest. What does it mean? Simply this, Carol. Then unless we can find a way to stop Glenn's growth very soon, his heart won't be able to carry the load any longer. And he'll die. How soon? Matter of days. How will it happen? His mind will go first. And then his heart will literally explode. Why is this horrible thing happening? I've searched everywhere for the answer, and I can't find it. All night, I, I lie awake thinking, why? 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 Why does it have to happen? Well, you're a doctor. Tell me. I wish I knew, Carol. I wish I knew. I, uh, I've got to make my report to Washington. Anything yet? Nothing conclusive. Right. Hello, Colonel. How are you, Doctor? We don't have time to become discouraged, Eric. We've got to find an answer quickly. Did you tell Carol? Yeah. She still won't leave. Well, I can't say that I blame her, but she's got to go. We can't take any more chances. Any change in the new animals? 
None. Absolutely no change of any kind. I check their galvanic reflexes on the hour every hour. The results are the sum total of absolutely nothing. Paul, I don't think we've got a chance. The theory is just great, on paper. It just doesn't stand up under practical application. You know, Eric, it might be better if we concentrate the experiments with the guinea pigs and the rabbits in the lab. Since time is so important, we have the advantage of their short life cycle. Well, the small animals can't stand up to the high-frequency stimulation. Let's continue the injections with the small animals and confine the high-frequency experiments to these. All right. Seems logical. Everything seems logical. Till you look at our giant. expect? Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs? I heard you cry out in pain. I was worried about you. Tomorrow may be an important day, Glenn. Dr. Colt has been experimenting with some animals, a theory of some kind he's been working on. And he said he'll know the results by morning. How tall do you suppose I'll grow before death? releases me from this curse. Hundred feet? Maybe a thousand? Could be a mile. <laughs> That'd be something, wouldn't it? <laughs> Can't you imagine that, Carol? <laughs> Please, Glenn, don't torture yourself. <laughs> I wouldn't actually have to worry too much about breathing till I got about three miles up. The oxygen starts to thin up up there. Glenn. I'm a lost cause, Carol. They're not going to find the answer tomorrow or any tomorrow. You just picked the wrong number. Go on, pick up your chips. Go on home. Do you think I could leave you alone at a time like this? You never did know when to quit, did you? Well, can you take a hint? I want you to get out and leave me alone. I don't want you around, do you hear? Say whatever you wish to me, Glenn, but please, please hold on until they try everything possible. There must be a cure for it. There must be. Suppose I stop it. So what? I stop growing. What then? Can't you imagine what a wonderful life we'd have together? <laughs> me up here and you down. What is it, Glenn? Anything I can do? Yes! Get out! Leave me alone! Manning's disappeared, Eric. We can't find him anywhere on the grounds. But you've got to find him. Well, Colonel Halleck, security officer for the area, is out canvassing the desert with his men. It's my fault. I had an argument with him last night. Well, they won't go far. Paul, I've got the answer. I've got the answer. The answer is in the bone marrow. The bone marrow. We were so close we couldn't see it. Yeah. Dr. Lang's work on radiation exposure. Sulfahydro. Inject sulfahydro compounds into the bone marrow. Exactly. The thing that fooled us was we were looking for some unknown quantity in the plutonium radiation, while all the time it was acting to a degree the same as a hydrogen exposure. The secret was in the degree of the exposure. 
Well, then injections of the sulfur hydro compound should correct the body's regenerative balance. Well, I can see where this would stop his growth, but... You do think you can save him? It may stop his growth, but it won't diminish his size. The stimulation of the hormone secretions in the pituitary or growth-controlling glands will take care of that. You know, it doesn't sound practical, Eric. I, I don't think it'll work. Here, take a look. That's amazing. It's hard to believe, but it worked. I used high-frequency stimulation in the pituitary gland, causing the hormone secretion to reverse the growth process. First, injections of the sulfohydral compounds into the bone marrow. That will stop the growing. And then stimulate the pituitary gland to reduce its size. But do you think you'll be able to in inject him with a hypodermic needle this size? I've had an oversized needle constructed. As a matter of fact... Doctor. I, uh, I couldn't find Manning any place. My men covered an area of ten square miles. But we can't lose him. Now we just can't. Just when we have the problem licked. Colonel, can you get us a helicopter? We have two helicopters, but only one pilot. All right. We'll use them to find Manning. Eric? You go with the pilot, and I can fly the other one. Colonel, it's imperative that we find him as quickly as possible. We think we've found a cure, but only if we get to him in time. Helicopter William X-ray. Helicopter William X-ray. This is Charlie Dog. Come in. This is William X-ray. Go ahead. We are over Boulder Dam. Everything looks normal. We're heading towards Las Vegas. Now we'll keep trying in this direction. It's getting late, so if you don't find them within the hour, you turn back and we'll continue tomorrow. The distance between our position here and the location where you spotted the dead cattle, marked by the pin, is only about 50 miles. Now, he certainly can travel faster than that. He's been gone over 15 hours. He's probably been moving back and forth in a nameless pattern. I'll never understand why someone hasn't reported seeing him. How tall would you guess he's grown to by now? 50. Maybe 55 feet. Sooner or later, someone's bound to see him. Maybe take a shot at him. Colonel, maybe we're making a mistake in not informing the civil authorities. No, I can't do that. You know the orders. We could use help in tracking him down. I'm not worried about finding him. As soon as it gets light, I'll show you some action. I just hope he lasts through the night without getting into trouble. <laughs> If anything comes in, no matter how trivial, if it's about the giant, call me. If I'm asleep, wake me. Yes, sir. Oh, and, uh, Sergeant, place a call to the Nevada State Police. Ask them to report anything unusual. Uh, missing cattle, broken fences, anything out of the way. What will I give them for a reason, sir? Think of something. Anything. Yes, sir. 
Doctor, I want to ask you a question. And I'd like a straight answer. Well, yes. Do you consider Manning dangerous? If we can get to him, we can help him. You haven't answered my question. I truthfully don't know. Well, I want to make something clear to you, Doctor. I've ordered up two more companies of men to help with the search, and I don't intend to risk casualties. If, when they find him, he shows any signs of violence, we'll have to stop him. And I mean stop him cold. It's not a wild beast you're talking about. He's a human being. But a potentially dangerous one, Miss Forrest. We won't hurt him unless he gives us cause. But his mind is sick. There's no telling what he'll do or where he'll go. He's out there somewhere, and we'll find him. Not another drop, Alf. Not another drop as long as I live, so help me. Should have been confined. A fence or something. Maybe chains. We had no business letting him run loose like we did. How were we to know? We should have known. The symptoms were there, Eric, in black and white. We were so engrossed in finding a cure, we failed to recognize the warnings. Any word yet? No, not a thing. If only we can find him before it's too late. Why did I have to argue with him? Now another one to take the blame. I'm going to bed before it's my turn. We're taking off quite early in the morning. Is the needle and medication all set? Since he left, but I'll double check. No. Carol, a few days ago I suggested that you leave. Now I'm going to insist that you leave. It's no longer safe for you. Glenn Manning is a sick man in mind as well as body. Dr. Lindstrom, I'm not leaving. I've already wired Washington for permission to lift security restrictions. Now, the restrictions will probably be unnecessary by morning anyway. Someone's bound to see him. You had no right to do a thing like that. Don't you have any heart? You're an intelligent girl, Carol. Can't you see the futility of the situation? There's nothing more that you can do to help him. Besides, if and when we do find him, it's very likely he won't even recognize you. Then you don't believe that you can save him. Possibly, if we can get to him in time. Well, I'm not leaving until I know. Doctor, Miss Forrest, we've had two more reports of slaughtered cattle. Was there anything else? He was seen by a couple of motorists. And Manning is about ten times the height and width of a normal man. And as closely as Dr. Lindstrom and Dr. Colder can estimate, Glenn Manning should weigh about 18,000 pounds. Now, I don't anticipate any trouble whatsoever in finding our giant. In fact, we possibly could have found him last night, after the two motorists reported seeing him. But since we don't know exactly what mental change may have taken place during Manning's continued growth, I thought it best to wait until daylight. Therefore, our greatest problem is not in finding him, but what to do with him after he's found. Dr. Lindstrom will brief you on that. Now, naturally, we're not certain that it'll work. But the success or failure of the treatment may very well depend on how soon we're able to administer it. Under Colonel Halleck's command, you men will be in charge of the search patrols. Now, as soon as he's found, Dr. Colder and I will fly to him in a helicopter and take over from there. Colonel. 
As you know, this is our position here. Slaughtered cattle have been found here, 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 and here. The two motorists reported seeing him at this point here on Highway 93. And from the way he's been zigzagging back and forth, we can assume that Manning is somewhere here in the southern tip of Nevada. And we're going to cover every inch of it until we find him. Now here's a procedure of operation. Six observation planes were sent up from the Victorville Air Base and are now searching from the air. They will be in radio contact with me at all times. Captain Hamilton, you will divide your company into units of 25 men. And starting from our position here, you will fan them out in an arc of 180 degrees and head east. Captain Fraser, you will also divide your company into units of 25 men. Trucks will take them to the place where Highway 91 crosses the border of Nevada and Arizona. You will then fan them out in an arc of 180 degrees and head westward. I will accompany one of your units. Are there any questions? Sir, what do we do when we spot him? Each unit will be equipped with a radio. Now, when you see him, report to me immediately. I will relay the information to the helicopter of Dr. Lindstrom and Major Coulter, and they will rush to the spot to medically treat him. And now a word of warning. You are not to advance any closer to the giant than 50 feet. Your men will be well armed, but you are not to fire, except in the case of self-defense. Remember, stay away from him. The giant is potentially dangerous. All right, dismiss. Otherwise, we might have to make more than one shot. And so the Chamber of Commerce has decided to increase the annual advertising budget here in Las Vegas. Well, it looks like the FSOOE, that stands for Flying Saucer Observers of Earth, have a competitor in the Seeing Strange Things department. And this time it's right here in Nevada. Now, it seems that two motorists driving south on Highway 93 barely missed a collision with, now get this, a 60-foot giant. What have you got to top that one? Calling ground unit three. This is observation plane King Nancy. Over. Observation plane King Nancy. This is ground unit three. Go ahead. I see him, sir. I see the giant. He's just outside of Las Vegas and is moving toward the resort hotel section. Over. Ground Unit 3, Ground Unit 3, this is Helicopter William X-Ray. I heard the report, Colonel Halleck. We're changing our course. Should arrive in Las Vegas in about 14 minutes, off and clear. Observation plane King Nancy, this is ground unit three, Colonel Halleck speaking. Are you still flying over Las Vegas? Over. Roger. I can see the giant moving along the strip. Over. Land your plane at once and contact the local police. Tell him not to attack or fire on the giant unless he becomes violent. Tell him to keep away from him. We are north of Boulder Dam and should be in Las Vegas within 40 minutes. Off and clear.
seemed like a joke or a prank, but a few hours ago has now become a reality. A reality in a king-size package over 60 feet tall. Police Chief Benson has asked me to tell you to stay in your homes. Stay in your homes. The Army is rushing two doctors to Las Vegas by way of helicopter. They apparently know what to do with the giant. What I'd like to know is, where did he come from? How much further? We'll be in Las Vegas in about 30 minutes. Well, there's one thing we didn't give much thought to. Huh? What's that? Just how much of a job it's going to be to give him this shot. I think he's going to stand there and let us do it? As I say, shoot him. Here comes the giant! Stand by and let him destroy property. Pick up some of the action and excitement through our window. We can't see him, but from the petty counter on the street, he must be. Wait a minute. Here he is, a 60 foot giant in the streets of Las Vegas. Look at the size of that man. City heading toward Boulder Dam. We are nearing the Arizona side of Boulder Dam. We'll cut him off when he tries to cross. Over. He's just ahead of us, Colonel. We'll try to stop him before he reaches the dam. Right. Over and out.
Eric, get the needle ready. We're setting down here. Ready? One, two, three. Look out, he's 